Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to resilience, business continuity, disasters, COVID, well-being, anything that helps you, your organization, or your community prepare for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. A couple of quick announcements. I will be speaking at the Disaster Recovery Journal Conference, uh, Fall 2021, uh, October 11th to 14th. I know I was going to be at the Continuity Insights, but uh, that's not happening anymore. So DRJ asked me to speak there. And I will also be an MC for a DRJ conference. November 3rd to 4th, I am speaking at the Business Continuity Institute's World Virtual Conference. And December 1st to 2nd, I am speaking at Continuity and Resilience Today Conference, which I hope I can attend in person because it's just down the road for me in Toronto. Now, a lot of listeners and viewers will know that I love to read. I read multiple books a, a week. And if you've ever listened to a segment that I do with James Green every month, This Week in Business Continuity, at the end, we talk about some of the books that we read. And I've usually got three or four on the go at every single time. And one of the recent books I read is called Warring Signs, Identifying School Shooters Before They Strike. And I'm lucky enough today to have the author of that book, Dr. Peter Langman. Dr. Langman, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Now, uh, I know about you because I read uh, the introduction of your book and how you got into what you do. Could you take a minute or two and tell us about yourself, what you do, and how you got into this? Okay, well, currently I do several things. I'm a researcher with the National Threat Assessment Center of the United States Secret Service. So uh, as part of that, I study perpetrators of mass violence and contribute to their reports. I'm also employed by a company called DriftNet Securities that's involved in school safety and violence prevention. Also still have a few clients in a private practice as a psychologist. And uh, the book you just mentioned, Warning Signs, is my third book on the topic of school shooters. My first one came out in 2009, and that's called Why Kids Kill Inside the Minds of School Shooters. And in 2015, uh, my next book came out, and that's called School Shooters, Understanding High School, College, and Adult Perpetrators. Uh, happy subjects, obviously. But <laughs> now I, I'm really happy you're here. I came across the book when I saw the announcement on LinkedIn. And as soon as I saw it, I went, oh, that's going to be interesting. So I made sure I got a copy right away. And as soon as I got halfway through it, I said, I, I, I've got to talk to Dr. Langman about this. This is really interesting. This is definitely uh, falls within the parameters of preparing for the unexpected. I, I'm curious, though, as a psychologist, and you mentioned your other books, how did these books come about? Because this obviously is not a, a happy you know, uh, subject. Th this is very serious. Right. Well, the story in terms of my involvement with the issue of school shootings and mass violence and so on really began in 1999. I was working as a psychologist at a psychiatric hospital for children and adolescents. And on April 20th, 1999, there was the attack at Columbine High School. And just 10 days after that, we had a 16-year-old boy admitted to our hospital because he was seen as a Columbine type risk. He had a hit list. He was engaging in strange and disturbing behavior. There was a threat on his website to, to kill somebody. And people saw the warning signs and, and got him to the hospital. And after that, there was another potential school shooter who came through our doors and another one. And I was there over 12 years and I saw a pretty steady stream of these kids, potential school shooters or other types of potential killers coming to the hospital, I was evaluating them as a psychologist, trying to make sense of them, recommend appropriate treatment, engage in a risk assessment to see if they really were a potential threat. And that put me on the path of just studying, not just the kids coming through the hospital, but the, the perpetrators of school shootings across the nation. Well, my first question for you then, because you've seen so many people and there are you mentioned quite a few in here, and uh, I have to admit that uh, most of them I had never heard of before. 
Uh, and I'm wondering, are there any, let, let's, let's take a, back, a step back. Is there a stereotypical school shooter? Because of the, the media would, and, and movies even, will have us uh, believe it's uh, a male, teens, or early university, late high school, and that's it. Is, is there such a thing? No, there, there's a stereotype, but it's not an accurate stereotype. You know, it's often um, viewed as something that's a, a white male phenomenon, teenagers who are the misfits, the outcasts at school, the victims of bullying, who get fed up with being picked on and then seek retaliation against their tormentors. And that very rarely is actually what happens. There's greater uh, racial ethnic diversity, then people tend to realize there's also female school shooters. Not a lot, but that does happen. They're not all teenagers. About half of them actually are adults. That's why I called my second book, School Shooters, Understanding High School, College, and Adult Perpetrators, because there have been school shooters in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and even one in his 60s. So the range of perpetrators is far greater than people tend to realize. And many of them are not the misfits, the outcasts, and so on that uh, we tend to think they are. Uh, let's jump right into that, because that's the next part. What are some of the characteristics of a shooter if they're, they're not stereotypical white male, high school, early university? What other characteristics do some of these um, shooters or potential shooters have? Well, there's no prototype stereotype um, there's no profile as such, but there are patterns. And my research has uncovered three different types of shooters, three different categories. They end up doing the same thing. They all commit you know, mass attacks at schools, but how they got to that point and why they're doing it you know, varies dramatically. So if you'd like, I can talk about those three types. Sure. Okay. The first is what I call the psychopathic school shooter. And people may have some idea of what a psychopath or sometimes the term is used uh, sociopath, you know, what that means. For me, it's someone who's profoundly narcissistic. They really live for themselves. Other people just don't figure in their world as human beings in the same sense that they see themselves. So they don't have empathy. Um, there's not, no guilt or remorse if they hurt people. In fact, they may actually be sadistic and go out of their way to hurt and eventually kill people because they get a thrill out of that. That gives them a sense of power and they get a rush from having power over people. So the idea here is kind of the callous, cold-blooded, sadistic person who just doesn't care about other people, doesn't care about morality or laws. They wanna do what they wanna do and they think they ought to be able to do it because they're special, they're superior, they're so full of themselves. What can, can someone be, cause I know you talk about um, psychopaths and uh, psychotic people and uh, a couple of other descriptions. Can anybody be all of those? Okay. Is well, it possible to be, you know, I don't even know how to describe it, but, you know, but, but, but carry all those characteristics. Okay, well, the three categories I've identified are the psychopathic, the psychotic, and the traumatized school shooters. And I've seen multiple shooters who fall into two of those categories, either psychotic and traumatized or psychopathic and psychotic. I haven't come across any that fall into all three. It doesn't mean it's not possible. I have not yet encountered that. What, what does traumatized mean? Because these people are, uh, I, I guess from an outsider, I see them as the people creating trauma. So how are they traumatized? Well, unlike the psychopathic and psychotic shooters who typically come from pretty much stable, intact families, the traumatized shooters are kids from families with a chronic and severe history of violence and dysfunction. So what does that look like? Well, one or both parents are either alcoholic or drug addicts. Mm. One or both parents are uh, 
criminals, maybe with a history of incarceration. There is physical abuse in the home. There may be sexual abuse either in the home or in the community or in the foster home that these kids end up in because they're acting out too much or their parents are too um, impaired to maintain the household. So these kids grow up with parents who have drunken rages, parents who are drug addicted, parents who are violent. There may be all kinds of unsavory people passing through the home. The kids are beaten, they may be molested. So it's a long history of one trauma after another. And yes, they ultimately then traumatize other people, but that kind of history is very different from what we see with the psychopathic or the psychotic shooters. And with the psychotic shooters, that's where the issue of mental illness comes into play. Many of these shooters have schizophrenia or another severe diagnosis that really impairs their psychological functioning. Well, what makes somebody who, uh, let's say, traumatized, because I, I've known people that have um, come from, let's say, uh, n- negative backgrounds, you know, not so happy homesteads, and they've never committed anything bad. So what turns them, turns um, one person into uh, a, a possible shooter more than someone else when their backgrounds could be exactly the same? Right, that's a great question. And I always emphasize that most people who are psychopathic, psychotic, or traumatized, don't become violent, never kill anyone, don't turn into school shooters. So those categories help us understand the perpetrators, but they're not complete explanations. So there are always other factors. And when you look at the the lives of the perpetrators, especially in the uh, months, weeks leading up to the attack, there's usually other factors. There could be uh, legal consequences. They get arrested in the community. Maybe they got suspended at school. Maybe they're flunking a class or or a whole grade. Um, Maybe they just got dumped by a girlfriend or maybe they're trying desperately to find a girlfriend and no one goes out with them. Um, There's always a series of stressors, one on top of another, in addition to their being psychopathic, psychotic, or traumatized. So it's always a combination of a lot of different factors. There's no one thing. It's not as simple as saying he got teased in gym class. That does not explain mass murder. Um, So I think there's a tendency to want to simplify this phenomenon. And what we really need to do is understand it's very complex. And there's many factors that put someone on the path of a school shooting. Well, I know we're going to get to that very soon. I'm just kind of curious. with regards to uh, people that going through the same experiences, is it that some of these, uh, cause you mentioned a few passing a grade or, or uh, not passing, sorry, a class or failing a test or being uh, turned down by a, a, a prospective girlfriend or boyfriend even, is it that things build up so much after a time they cannot handle it anymore? And then that one event becomes their trigger? It could be that there's a single uh, triggering event, something that happens, the so-called, you know, the final straw. Um, Could be just a lot of different things coming together, again, on someone who's already not really solid from a a psychological perspective. And I think it's different for different perpetrators. It might look a bit different for the psychopathic versus the psychotic and so on. And again, there's other factors. There's, um, in today's world, often we see a desire to be famous, to make a name for yourself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these shooters know that if they kill a lot of people, they're gonna be instantly known throughout the world. So for some kids who are that desperately insecure, that desperately feeling so insignificant, that is a powerful attraction. For other people, they may get caught up in some sort of ideology. We see numerous school shooters who are drawn to uh, Hitler and the Nazis. Some are drawn to Satanism, white supremacy. So they often latch on to an ideological justification for their rage, for feeling uh, victimized, for justifying killing other people. So again, there's kind of layer upon layer of factors 
that we mm -hmm. see once you start going deep into uh, their lives. Well, I know we're going to talk about um, some of those uh, aspects that uh, you just mentioned, uh, like immersion. And um, what was the other one? Um, oh, I just had the word. Uh, I, I think immersion is the, the key one, you know, how you recognize some of these people. I know we're going to we're going to get to that. I just wanted to touch on something, a conversation I had last uh, night with a neighbor <clears throat> about uh, this topic, because I mentioned, oh, tomorrow I have a show to record, and this is going to be the topic, and they went, oh, and somehow, I don't know how we, we got there, but we were looking at um, punishments for these crimes, because we're, we're always telling people, you know, don't steal, you you know, our kids don't steal, you're going to go to jail, the cops will come and visit. Don't do this, you know, the cops are going to come and visit. And what I, I, I didn't read it in the book, and maybe it's because it's not not out there. And uh, I was just curious from the conversation I had. Is there any deterrent when it comes to punishment? Or is that not even something people think of in these situations? P punishment, you know, going to jail or, or whatever, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even enter their, their psyche. I don't think the prospect of punishment is a factor. A lot of the shooters are going in to the attack with the mindset that they're going to die. Either they're mm -hmm. going to be gunned down by police or they're going to kill themselves. Even if they're not going to kill themselves, this is usually not a crime that people expect to get away with. They walk in undisguised to a school where people recognize them and they're willing to go to prison. Um, they're going to do what they're going to do. And if they don't die, they'll be in, in prison. They know that. Uh, that does not seem to be a deterrent factor. Hmm. I was just curious. It was interesting how we latched on to that. And I thought, well, that's an interesting question. I'll ask because I didn't read it in the book. So that's uh, an interesting point. Uh, on that, we've come to the end of our first segment. We are talking with Dr. Peter Langman and his book, Warning Signs. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Today we are talking with Dr. Peter Langman, author of Warning Signs. Dr. Langman, great first segment, lots of good information there. Now, I'm wondering if we lined up, let's say 10 people, five men and five, five women, how would we be able to distinguish who the potential shooter is? What kind of things would we look at? And I know you've talked about immersion, leakage, and you gave some other examples. So how would we recognize? Well, you can't recognize a potential school shooter without the relevant information. You can't just take a demographic profile, say it's a 16-year-old white male from a divorced family. That doesn't mean anything. What we need is evidence that they're on the pathway of violence. And one of the key terms there is what's called leakage, which means they leak their intentions. And kids leak their intentions in multiple ways. They may just tell their friends, hey, guess what I'm gonna do? Or they may warn them to stay away. Don't be in school tomorrow, I'm bringing in a gun. I don't want you to get hurt. So mm -hmm. that's leakage. If, if kids are taught to take that seriously and report it, you can stop the attack. Kids may also leak on social media or post announcements online on various websites. Um, they tell the world sometimes what they're going to do. So leakage is a key concept when you're talking about identifying a potential school shooter or any kind of attacker. Uh, they often just want people to know whether it's bragging or as I said, warning people to stay away or maybe trying to recruit a friend to join them. Kids encounter a lot of leakage. If anyone is going to encounter the leakage, it's most likely the peers. That's why it's so important that schools teach their students about leakage and that they have a, an anonymous tip line for kids to report what they hear to make it easy for kids to come forward with what they know. But let you know, I, we've all gone to school <clears throat> and we've all heard our, our friends or, or people we know that uh, said something, you know, I hate professor so-and-so, or I can't stand, you know, the principal, you know, I wish they'd fall off the earth or whatever. 
you know, whatever the case may be. So a lot of people, uh, you know, and you even hear it now in daily life, you know, oh, I can't stand that person, or I wish something would happen to them. But how do you identify that the leakage that they're uh, putting forth is real, is a real concern? Not just, you know, um, anger in the moment and then off they go and they're completely fine. Yeah. Right. And that's a great question. And that's where the concept of threat assessment becomes essential. And threat assessment is a process that schools or any organization can use to determine, is it a false alarm or is it a real threat? Is it just two kids fighting and one says, you do that to me one more time and I'm going to kill you? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't mean it. He's just mad. Or does he really have homicidal intentions? And threat assessment means you have some school staff trained to investigate that. You bring the kids in who made those comments, bring in any witnesses to it. You, you talk to people, maybe the teachers have heard something or witnessed something in their classroom. You gather your data and then decide, is the reason to take this seriously or can we let it go? And another key concept besides leakage is what's called attack-related behavior. And attack-related behavior is anything that shows someone's preparing for an attack. And the significance of this is, it's not just a comment made in anger, it's not just a passing thought, it's not just a fantasy, wouldn't it be nice if so-and-so dropped dead? It's concrete action taken to commit an attack. So attack-related behavior could be deciding how to smuggle a gun in the school. It would be getting your hands on a gun and maybe practicing with it. It could be building the explosives you intend to use um, to see if you can get that to work. It could be um, diagramming the school and, and maybe charting a, a path through the school to minimize your exposure to surveillance cameras or the school resource officer whose office is here and you wanna bypass that. Anything that suggests this is not just a fantasy or not just a comment made in anger, but a serious intention. So you have leakage, but when you have attack related behavior, that means it's a more imminent danger. You, you describe it in the book, um, <clears throat> you say with, with some of this leakage, and I hope I'm uh, paraphrasing correctly here, but you, know, it, you take a threat seriously if it has um, a, a place, a time, a person, or an intent, or something along that lines, correct? Right. You're There's referring to what I call, to yeah, that's what I call evidence of imminence. If someone says, for example, um, I stole my father's shotgun, and Friday at noon, I'm getting revenge in the cafeteria. We have a time, a place, a method. It's going to be a shooting rather than a bombing or a stabbing. And we know he has access to the means because he's stolen his father's shotgun. So the idea there is the more details that are already in place, the more imminent the threat. So that's what I call evidence of imminence. When you have time, place, method, and access to the method, that's a, a very dangerous situation. Now, you also talked uh, <clears throat> about recognizing someone because they're immersed in something. Can you talk right. about that, what you meant by uh, immersion? Right, that's uh, what I call a violence immersion, being uh, immersed in a world of violence, whether it's studying actual school shooters or other mass attackers, um, the books they read, the movies they watch, the uh, video games they play, all are you know, significantly in involving violent content, sadistic content, and so on. When they identify with previous school shooters, they study them, they, they read their journals, they start dressing like them or talking like them, imitating uh, certain phrases, either from Eric Harris at Columbine or from certain movies with killers. That aspect of immersion in a world of violence is something to keep in mind. It doesn't mean someone's on the path, but if you're already investigating someone because of leakage or attack related behavior and you see that violence emerge and that heightens the concern. 
In some cases, someone might dislike violent films or video games by itself. That's not a warning sign, but in conjunction with other warning signs like leakage or attack related behavior, that, that would worry me. That, that's actually what I was going to ask is because, you know, we probably all know somebody who loves violent movies or violent video games. And yet when they're away from that, they're gentle souls. You know, they're, they're all, uh, you know, happy people, hopefully, you know, so how, how far do you take that, you know, with, they've watched, uh, you know, a, a hundred horror movies, they, um, they made little comments over the last two years, but nothing ever happened. So where, where's that point where you turn around and say, you know what, now I have a concern. What well, has to happen? It's all part of the context. Is there a larger context in which the interest in violent media or studying Columbine fits into a pattern with leakage, attack related behavior and so on? You know, there's whole websites devoted, for example, to Columbine. And most of the kids who go on those websites never kill anybody. They may have an intellectual interest. Sometimes you have girls with a romantic interest in Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, even though they're dead, they fantasize about them and so on. So even an obsessive interest in Columbine doesn't mean someone's on the path of violence. But if you're investigating someone because he's made threats to kill people, or warned his friends to stay away from school on a certain day, and you uncover an obsession with Columbine, that fits into a, a bigger picture. But again, how long do you wait before you record? Uh, yeah, before you record an incident and, and um, uh, approach a teacher or a principal or a police officer, how long do you wait? Because uh, to your point, maybe the person is doing research for a school project or something. And you actually talked about that in here, which I thought was rather interesting. You know, that as soon as they start research on something like that, should you raise a flag and, you know, even just a small one, I'm just letting you know they're researching such and such and leave it at that. They, you, when, when do you turn around and, and say, you know, I got to report this to somebody? Well, my recommendation is don't wait, whether you're a student or a teacher or a parent or whoever sees a warning sign, because even if what you see is just one little thing, what maybe one comment, and you understandably don't want to overreact, it's just one comment. But if you don't report it, then you don't know that maybe a dozen other people have also heard one little comment or seen one little thing. So by reporting it, it can then be part of uh, the threat assessment team's uh, information, that one piece may just build on, like I said, a dozen other little pieces that people have reported. So that's why it's important that even if it doesn't seem like much, people do pass it along. It may not be anything significant. There may be no action required, but that could be a, a key piece of information that supplements a whole series of other reports that people have brought forward. Like a puzzle, one piece on its own may not mean anything, but when you put it with these other 10 pieces, all of a sudden you can see, uh, you know, right. a picture. Say, oh, exactly. hang on. You know, yeah. maybe we need to follow this through a little more. Mm -hmm. So if, if I did want to uh, report something, who do I go to? My parent, their parents? Is that actually, yeah, before we even go there. Is that even something I should consider going to that person's parents or family and saying, hey, are you aware of? Or should that be something we stay away from? Well, it depends who you are in this case. If you're another student, report it to the school. And a lot of schools have anonymous tip lines. Some states have state-run anonymous tip lines. That's a good place to start. You know, get that information to responsible adults, the people who need to have that and can follow up on it. And if you talk to your friend's parents, they may not uh, take it seriously. They may defend their child. Um, even if they are concerned, they may not report anyone because they don't want to get their own kid in trouble. So they may keep it to themselves and try to manage it on their own. You know, it's best to get it to the, the people who need it. 
and that would be you know school officials if it's a very serious risk if, if you know someone's stockpiling guns and bombs tell the school but you could also report that to the police um, because if there's clearly laws broken around firearms and explosives um, I would pass that along to both school and local law enforcement, or even FBI, depending again on the magnitude of the mm -hmm. danger. So re really, if, uh, I, I think you actually had it in the book. If you see something, say something. Right, you know, and, and, and then let, um, let the appropriate authorities do what they need to do, if anything, you know, they, but have there ever been instances where they've investigated and found nothing only to have that flip on them, because you mentioned earlier, you know, sociopaths and um, uh, people along that line, they're very good at hiding uh, who they are and what their intentions are. Right, there have been cases where reports have been made, investigations have been done, and uh, no significant follow-up only to have an attack occur. And that's happened not just with school shootings, but other types of uh, attackers as well. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, psychopaths can be very deceptive. They can be very good at what's called impression management, meaning they know how to make a good impression when they want to. So if they're caught into someone's office or a police shows up at their door, they can be really charming and seem so sincere and really fool people. So that's one reason why it's important to understand the concept of the psychopathic killer, because if you do try to intervene, it's very easy to be taken in and feel reassured that it's a good kid and he would never do such a thing, even as he's planning it. So yes, there have been cases where people have been interviewed or interrogated and it looked okay. And not long afterwards, then there's an attack. Yeah, yeah, I know you You had a couple of examples in here and as I was reading it going, thinking that, oh, this is an example of where something doesn't happen. And then you followed it up with, but something still did. And it's like, oh my goodness, how do you, how do I manage this? You know, uh, and then you kind of said, you know, if you see something, say something and then let things occur from there, you know, so. Um, right. Go ahead. Just to follow up on that, you know, that's why you do threat assessment and why threat assessment should not be limited to the person in question because a person might be very skilled at lying, deceiving, and charming people. Mm -hmm. That's why you talk to their peers, maybe you look on their social media, if that's available, talk to their teachers, they may have handed in homework assignments that foreshadow an attack that's happened in multiple cases, or sometimes the students have said things in class that in hindsight were warning signs. So you really wanna cover all the bases if you're doing a threat assessment, not just talk to the, the one student who made a comment. Interesting, if you're doing a threat, threat assessment, because I mentioned parents earlier on, do you include them in that assessment? Or if they have a job, do you include their uh, work colleagues and bosses in that assessment too, to see if it's, you know, if, if, if they're only just making the comments in school or if these comments are being heard in more than one location, but not being reported. Right, the more bases you can cover, the, the better the threat assessment. So parents may know something, whether or not they're willing to share it with you is another question, but you should certainly include them because they may know key pieces of information. Um, sometimes parents have known things, they did not speak up and there were attacks, you know. Um, Eric Harris's parents found a pipe bomb he had made, told him not to make any, they took it away. He went right on making them. They didn't know that, they didn't tell the police about it. Um, you know, sometimes parents know things about their kids' use of firearms or even building explosives in the home. This is important information and they may not want to report it on their own, again, trying to protect their child as they see it, but they should certainly be included in a threat assessment. Do we sometimes fall into this trap of, you know, I know Bob or I know Sally so well, there's no way they're gonna do anything. You know, I, I, is it denial that, you know, that there's no way I'm gonna think either one of them could do anything like this? 
So yeah. that's why I don't say anything. Absolutely. People don't believe it. Um, I write about denial in my book. There's a whole chapter on why people don't report warning signs when they encounter them. I think denial is part of it. Assuming they really know the person is um, a very common thing. Even with teachers or administrators, they maybe know the kid's parents, older siblings, they have a good view of the family. They tend to dismiss the warning signs. Again, if the student doesn't look like what they think a school shooter looks like. Um, sometimes kids are even concerned enough to ask their friend who's making these threats. You don't really mean that, do you? And the kid may put them off, you know, nah, I'm just joking. I would never do it. And then he goes ahead and does it anyway. So that's why it's important for kids not to try to handle it on their own. Make your report because their peers will lie to them. Then the kids have a sense of relief. They think, oh, it's not going to happen. He was just mad. He was just joking. Kids can obviously lie to their peers, say it's a joke, and then they go ahead and do it anyway. Right. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of Judge Judy. If you've ever watched her now and then, she said, when a teenager opens their mouth, it's usually a lie. <laughs> so it, it just got me thinking of that to put a little uh, smiley face on a very tough subject. Um, but I, I think that's really good. It's a great spot to end our second segment. We are talking today with Dr. Peter Langman and his book, Warning Signs, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Dr. Peter Langman and his book, Warning Signs, Identifying School Shooters Before They Strike. Uh, Dr. Langman, lots of great information here. Um, I, I just had a, a, a thought regarding uh, our current circumstances with COVID, because at the beginning, you talked about some of the, the trauma that uh, people have gone through that might lead them on this path. COVID has put a lot of trauma on a lot of people either losing their jobs or suddenly they're working from home um, with their partner and their kids are at home as well now. Do you think, and I'm not putting you on the spot here and I don't expect you to have the all the answers, but in your opinion, do you think that COVID might be one of these triggers for um, schools? Because around the globe, just about everybody is back at school now. It's certainly a concern among folks, you know, who are involved in school safety, you know, there's been a, a lot of uh, wondering about how this is gonna play out with students returning to school. Maybe a lot of pent up frustration, maybe increased stress at home. Anything that increases stress could increase the likelihood that you know, people who are already struggling, maybe on the verge of committing an act of violence, this could you know, put them over the edge. So nobody really knows, but that certainly is a significant concern going on at this time of year. And just for the record, I'm not suggesting COVID will create more shooting shootings. I'm, I'm, I just thought I'd ask, considering you know the, the times we're in. Yeah. Now, you also talked about the threat assessment. I just want to take a step back with regards to that. Uh, what if schools don't have something like this, uh, a threat assessment? What kind of things do they need to have in place so that people can report uh, things, what kind of uh, uh, mechanisms need to be in place by the school? Uh, should they be involved with external parties like police or something? How, how do you initiate the whole thing if they have nothing right now? That's a, a big question. And there, there's a lot of aspects to that. You know, first you need some people trained within the school in how to conduct a threat assessment. You need everyone to be aware that there is a threat assessment team, that's school staff as well as students and parents, so that they know there's a place to report safety concerns. But there's also all the infrastructure you need. How are you going to track reports? You know, you need some sort of software database in which to track information. You also need policies and procedures. This can be kind of sticky um, from an ethical and legal standpoint. You may need to consult with attorneys regarding what's the school allowed to do, what, what are they not allowed to do, and you know whose role is it to do certain aspects of threat assessment? Um, what's your, your policy around that? You need to have some forms to track information or um, 
record reports or whatever. So, you know, there's a lot of different aspects that go into this. Now, fortunately at this point, there's a lot of books out on threat assessment. So you don't have to start from scratch. Also, I have a website at uh, schoolshooters.info, I-N-F-O for information. And there's a whole page there called Prevention and School Safety. And there's several dozen documents on that page of my website relating to threat assessment, warning signs, violence prevention in schools and so on. So schools don't have to figure this out on their own. There's a lot of great resources available, including works by the FBI, the Secret Service, and individual researchers. Uh, just to clarify, schoolshooters.info? Yes. Okay, I'm going to put that in the description uh, below the video so that if anyone does want to check out that, um, they can go to it. Uh, I'm curious, if somebody is doing a threat assessment, do they have to be, or do they have to involve any police or anyone else uh, right off the bat? Or do they wait for their findings and then report their findings first? Great question. Certainly there's no reason to contact the police right off the bat unless you're facing an imminent threat of major violence at the school. It may be as simple as two kids had to fight one of them made a threatening comment. You talk to the two kids, you investigate. It may have just been a comment made in anger with no real intent behind it. You don't need to in involve the police. Mm -hmm. Now, I think a key point, though, is schools may not know when it is appropriate to contact the police. And that could vary from uh, you know, city to city, town to town, based on the police department and what their standards are. Are. So that's a conversation that school officials need to have with local law enforcement. You know, we don't want to criminalize ordinary student behavior, but we also don't want to miss significant warning signs, especially related to safety. When is it appropriate for us to contact you? You know, what's that threshold? When do you want to be notified? And that conversation, as I said, might go very differently in different parts of the country, in different locations. Um, so unless you have that conversation, you're not going to know when it's really appropriate to contact the police. So that would be an important conversation to have as you're developing your threat assessment team. Now, I'm, I'm curious to know, once you've performed the threat assessment, what happens post-assessment? Okay, another great question. If it's not a real threat if it's a false alarm, nothing really needs to happen. Unless maybe there's two kids who shouldn't socialize together anymore, even if it wasn't a homicidal threat, maybe it's a good idea to separate those two kids or you know put something in place. If it is a more serious threat though, that could play out differently depending on what evidence is uncovered. If they've broken laws, if they've been stealing guns and building bombs and so on, then there could be a, a legal consequence. They may end up either in probation or juvenile detention, again, depending on, on what's been uncovered. And there may be a mental health piece. As I said at the beginning, I got into this work because these kids were being identified and sent to a psychiatric facility. So there may be some kind of mental health intervention for these kids to continue in their schools, if that's going to happen, there should be some sort of safety plan put in place. Maybe they have to check in with someone every morning before going to class, or maybe have a weekly check-in, or maybe they have certain additional services put in place, whether it's counseling related or academic supports to help them out. Um, maybe they're seeing a mental health professional in the community to address the depression or the anger or to improve their social skills. But the safety plan should specify everything that is in place to maintain safety. It should be reviewed regularly, adapted as necessary, and then discontinued when it appears safe to do so. And I guess that's why it's necessary for friends and peers to <clears throat> make those reports when they hear something. Because maybe after that um, two kids fighting, 
that on itself may not seem as though it's something you need to investigate. But if you turn around and find out that one of those kids has been reported um, <clears throat> saying other things, then that fight would be all of, all of a sudden something of concern, you know, if they turned around and said something during that fight, right? Right. And even if the student in question is not actually planning an attack, it, it could still be a very troubled student, someone who's dealing with significant depression. They may be suicidal. Um, they may need a lot of supports of one kind or another, even if they're not on the path to perpetrate a, a mass attack. So that's why reporting concerns is always a good idea. Well, we've only got about four minutes left. Um, do you have any final thoughts or comments you'd like to convey? You know, one message I always try to uh, get through is these attacks are preventable. Many potential attacks are prevented. We tend not to hear about them because they don't make the headlines usually if nothing happens, so to speak. Um, there's sometimes there are news stories about attacks that were thwarted. And they're thwarted because people spoke up. Most commonly, other students spoke up. But in my book, I have examples of attacks that were followed by a parent, a grandparent, a member of the community who just came across something that seemed suspicious or worrisome, and they spoke up. So the idea of see something, say something is so important. Many potential attacks have been prevented. We can continue to expand the number that we do prevent. Um, there's so much that we can do. There's a lot in place already, but I think we need more in place. And that means in terms of school shootings, more threat assessment. It's, is there actually training out there for that? Now, I know you've got your website and information there, but is there actual training going on right now for school officials? Is that a yeah, part so, of anyone's curriculum or anything like that? Well, there's multiple organizations devoted to school safety that you know, have annual conventions, do professional development and so on. So I think uh, this is a growing trend to have threat assessment teams. In some states, they're even mandated for all schools and even uh, higher education institutions. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I just think there's still a, a, a long way to go. Yes. And on that note, uh, we've come to the end of our show. Uh, we've been talking with Dr. Peter Langman, author of Warning Signs, Identifying School Shooters Before They Strike. Dr. Langman, thank you very much for joining and spending your time with us today and sharing your expertise. And congratulations on the book, because I know it is relatively new. Thank you very much. And to everybody watching, stay prepared, everybody. If you liked that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave a message and let me know what your thoughts are. If you'd like to be a guest on the show to talk about something related to business continuity, disaster management, COVID, personal well-being, anything that's relatable to those subjects, you can reach me through my LinkedIn profile, which is in the video description. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. In the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.